Right. A famous preacher once joked from the pulpit, in English they teach us that two negatives make a positive statement. For an example, there's no way I'm not going to go. So the way I figure it, he says, if I know I'm lying and God knows I'm lying, I got to be telling the truth. That strikes us as funny because we don't think of truth as being flexible. Truth can't be altered or amended. Truth, by its very nature, is consistent, reliable, bedrock. You don't change truth. Responding to a reporter who was badgering her, Margaret Thatcher once remarked, of course it's the same old story. Truth usually is the same old story. As simple as the idea may seem, there are people who literally work to undermine the belief in absolute truth. The concept of moral relativism Moral relativism is, for those who are not familiar with the idea, is the belief that truth is changeable, that it is relative. In other words, what is true depends on your point of view. It's relative to your circumstances or your point of view. A high school textbook, Inquiries in Sociology, declared there are exceptions to almost all moral laws depending on the situation. What is wrong with one instance may be right in another. Supposedly, uh, radio personality George Denny had a ball he liked to display when the question of tolerance came up. Grasping the ball tightly in his hand, he would ask, what color is it? And the person questioned would take a quick look and answer black. And then he would then shake his head. The part I see is white. He would give the ball a twirl and show the other side. It was white. We could never agree on the color of this ball, Denny would point out, unless you knew my point of view and unless I realized you were looking at it from another point of view. Now that sounds reasonable when dealing with attitudes like tolerance and personal opinions, but if we use that standard when examining morality, we end up with no moral absolutes, no yardstick about what is right and wrong. All we're left with is a flexible standard regarding what is moral morally acceptable. And with that new found flexibility, we can become adrift in a society whose principles are based upon what the most people agree to. This, that society becomes dominated by a poll-driven morality. Moral relativism rejects the idea that there is absolute truth. In fact, those who reject absolute truth are absolutely sure. There is no absolute truth. Some of the principles of relativism are there are two sides to every question, there are exceptions to almost all moral laws, and no one has the right to say someone else's activities are morally wrong. You might say, Frank, what? that's well and good, but why tell us this? Because we live in an age that is dominated by this philosophy. Years ago, Newsweek declared, despite the call for virtue, we live in an age of moral relativism. Over the past, several surveys have found that fully three out of every four Americans believe there are not moral absolutes. When they surveyed teenagers, it was the same ratio, three out of four. But when but then they also found that four out of five also claimed that nobody can know for certain whether or not they actually know what truth is. This may help to explain why the majority of teenagers in that survey, 57% said that lying was sometimes necessary, not merely convenient, common, 
understandable, acceptable, but necessary. John Leal in U.S. News years ago quoted a professor, Robert Simon, of Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, as reporting that 10 to 20 percent of his students acknowledged the Holocaust but couldn't bring themselves to say that killing millions of people was wrong. One student told Simon, of course I dislike the Nazis, but who is to say they are morally wrong? Leo went on to note two disturbing articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education say, say that some students are unwilling to oppose large moral horrors, including human sacrifice, ethic cleansing, slavery, because they think no one has the right to criticize the moral views of another group of culture. How does this happen? How do people get to point, this point when they reject absolute truth and embrace self-sincerity? Because of rebellion. Daniel 8.12 states, because of rebellion, truth was thrown to the ground. Partly because absolute truth gets in the way of what many people want to do with their lives. Jeremiah 7.28 declared, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of Yahweh the Elohim, nor receiveth corrections. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Partly because people don't want Yahweh or anyone else in charge of their lives. Paul wrote that there were those who had a form of godliness but denying its power, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And lastly, rejection of absolute truth has happened because Satan is still ruler of this world. And scripture tells us Satan is a liar. Yeshua said, referring to Satan, when he lies he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8 verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So if this world is Satan's domain, is it any wonder that so many people reject absolute truth? Is it any wonder so many are in rebellion? rejecting Yahweh's authority and wanting to live their lives on their own terms. Satan has always attempted to undermine truth. If we go to Genesis chapter 3, we see Satan in his best form and using three ways of attacking Yahweh's truth. He questions truth, he denies the truth, and he casts doubt on Yahweh, the source of absolute truth. First, he questions the truth. Yahweh told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the fruit. It will kill you. You'll die. Adam and Eve took that as a moral absolute. Yahweh said it. They believed it. And that is settled. But then Satan comes for a visit. He started with a question. Did Yahweh really say Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has Yahweh Elohim said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice he uses the word really. I had a skeptic attempt to ambush me by asking, Do you really believe in demons? Behind this woman's question was a host of logistical sidelines that I knew that she'd attempt to take me down to discredit me. Inherent in these questions is a subtle mocking. You can't really <clears throat> be serious. 
When asked if I believed in demons, I wasn't sure how to respond. I sensed the, sensed the trap. But I wasn't clever enough to come up with an original answer, so I fell back on what the most basic argument. I replied, well, the Bible says that there are angels and, the, and that demons are fallen angels. So yes, I guess I believe in demons. My questioners stopped in their tracks and didn't attempt to argue about it anymore. Now, I don't think this was a particularly clever response, but I do believe that this was the best answer that I could have given. Satan stepped up and challenged my faith, and the Holy Spirit came in and helped me out. And you know, that's just how Yeshua dealt with Satan in the desert. Satan challenged Yeshua, attempting him to get him to deny the truth of his mission, and each time Yeshua responded, it is written. If it's good enough for Yeshua, I guess it should be good enough for us. The only way to deal with skeptics, agnostics, and atheists, and those who would challenge the faith is to appeal to Yahweh's truth. If we do this, we will never have to apologize. Yeshua said, Yahweh's word, the Bible, is truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. When challenging on, on, on uh, what you believe, if you appeal to scripture, you will never go wrong. Remember, Satan's first strategy was to attempt to question truth. Secondly, Satan denied the truth. Genesis 3 verse 4 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. You won't surely die, he said. And thus he tried to influence her by giving his opinion. Opinion is what lies at the heart of relativistic deals. Ideal. Morality by majority opinion. In our society, polls and surveys are regularly taken to determine what people accept as being right and wrong. It is so democratic, so tolerant of the other's feeling and opinions. And yet, majority morality can so often be used to defeat that which is actually right and true. There's a story of a preacher who was having a violent argument with his board. He was unwavering in his opposition to their decision. Realizing they were getting nowhere with the preacher, the board called for the vote. And the results were 12 to 1. Uh, and it was, he was the only negative vote. Nevertheless, the preacher was admin, and he prayed to God, he showed these men that I'm right. And almost immediately, what had been a clear summer day outside the building turned immediately into a dark and terrible storm ripped across the landscape. The board observed this development with some discomfort, but told the preacher that while that did seem like an answer to his prayer, it was not proof that God was against them. So the preacher prayed again, and the ground shook beneath their feet. The windows rattled, and the tables and chairs moved across the floor. Again, the board seemed shaken. There had never been earthquakes in that area before. But they still agreed this didn't prove anything. Again, the preacher fell to his knees, and he prayed, Tell them I'm right! Lightning split the night. Crashing through the window split the table in half, and a voice thundered from heaven, He's right! Board members picked themselves up off the floor, looked uneasily at each other, and then nodded the chairman. And the chairman then sad, sadly spoke, It may be that God agrees with you, but you're still outvoted 12 to 2. Relativistic morality is a morality based on majority opinion. It is based upon what seems right to the most people. But Yahweh said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death, and it also repeats it 
in Proverbs 16.25. The final argument Satan used was to cast doubt on Yahweh. Many people who become atheists do so because they feel that Yahweh has somehow disappointed them. Either life has turned against them or that those who were Christians have fallen short of some other event has caused them to become angry with the idea that Yahweh could have done something different in their lives. Since people who love, since people who have become disillusioned feel that Yahweh has disappointed them, the only, major, uh, uh, the only authority they feel they can trust in this is themselves. And if Yahweh is taken out of the picture, there is no final authority of what is right and wrong, except themselves. That's exactly what Satan was attempting to convince Eve of in his last temptation. In Genesis 3, verse 5, we read, For Elohim does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as Elohim's, knowing good and evil. Do you see what Satan is implying? Yahweh doesn't want what's best for you. He's jealous of you. He knows you'll be just like him. Now notice what happens next. Eve's opinion became the standard of what was true. She saw the tree was good for food. I doubt she was hungry. It was pleasing to her eyes. There was other fruit in the garden just as pleasing and desirable for obtaining wisdom, a wisdom Yahweh would deny her. So she took the fruit and gave some to her husband. How do we deal with this last challenge by Satan? We need to realize that even when life doesn't turn out the way we want it to, Yahweh still cares. Yahweh still loves us. Yahweh still wants to do what is best for our lives. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love Yahweh, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now notice this passage does not say all things are good does not say all things are from Yahweh. What it does say is, all things will work together for good. That is absolute truth. Nothing else matters as long as we cling to that reality. And then the final story is, a man by the name of Spurgeon was walking through an English countryside with a friend. And as they tro strolled along, the evangelist noticed a barn with a weather vane on its roof, and on top of it it says, God is love. Spurgeon remarked to his companion that he thought this was a rather inappropriate place for such a message. Weather vanes are changeable, he said, but God's love is constant. I don't agree with you, said his companion. You misunderstand the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth. Regardless of which way the wind blows, God is love. May Yahweh bless you with eyes, bless you with eyes to see his absolute truth and follow him.